open for you. Please grant me this. And then you state what it is. And you know, Our Father, Hail Mary, you've seen it before. Yeah. And then he reminds him in a different way. Uh, so three times he reminds God what he said. And then at the end, there's a Hail Holy Queen. It's very short. It takes about 10 minutes. He prayed that every day for the people that asked for his prayer. And so it's a pretty powerful I think something like that, accompanied with the desire, was probably all we need to get started on this road. You find Jim. that in the Pieta prayer book, okay. along with many other, many other prayers. prayers. The Pieta prayer book is available everywhere, I guess. You can... I, I get it at the Shrine bookstore. That's, okay. that's where I get it, with the big print. <laughs> <laughs> they have it there. They have okay. it both in English and Spanish. Great. Right. Well, I was, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to write to the Padre Pio Foundation and get some of these little booklets because they're, they're, they're all, it's a collection of all his prayers and some he wrote himself. And I'm just going to leave a bunch of them out in front of the church up here because I think they'd be really useful uh, to everybody. What's <clears throat> the name of that prayer? Uh, it's uh, it's just a prayer to the Sacred Heart. That, yeah. uh, and you can only get it in this pamphlet only at the shrine? Or it, oh, it's no, no, closest, any no, no, Catholic no. bookstore. What's the closest no, location? But it's called the Pieta Prayer Book. Yeah, it's got a green cover. What's the closest location at my uh, go to your computer, get on yeah, Amazon, yeah, Amazon, go to Amazon.com, <laughs> put in Pieta Prayer Book and stand back. <laughs> they have everything. I mean, uh, mm. or, or look up Padre Pio Foundation, Cromwell, Connecticut. Again, Google it and... Uh, you can order any anything they Last have. Last time I ordered something from Amazon, I got really small print. I mean, not large. Print, oh, okay. But I like the medium size. Interesting. I like to look at the different. Well, that's I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I go past it every day to work. I'll bring you a book next week. What a deal! Work, John. Where hey, what a house? deal! Huh? Where, where is this place? Shrine. The shrine. It's downtown. Yeah, it's down at Michigan Avenue, on Northeast Washington <laughs> Catholic University, <laughs> right across from it, the shrine. In it's in their bookstore. They have a bookstore. It's right on the yeah. first floor. Okay. It's I'm open there, all day long. Bookstore. What's, what is the uh, nearest Catholic? I mean, that's a good question. It used to be question. right next door. And then that, that, hey, that's a good question. Uh, Where is the nearest Catholic, quote-unquote, Catholic bookstore? There used bookstore? to be one in Wheaton. I don't know if it's still well, there or not. Our Lady of Bethesda has a, has a bookstore. Bookstore down in, okay. On Bradley Boulevard. Yeah, I don't know of a closer one. That's the closest that I can think of. Do you know if they have that book? We'd have to call. I don't know. I thought they have a good bookstore. They probably do. You can certainly get this one from the Daughters of St. Paul online, so buck fifty. Okay, uh, what do we mean by knowing God directly? That probably hangs a lot of people up. Uh, while we gather to worship God and we read the scriptures to learn about God and respect the church's teachings about God, there is no substitute for knowing God directly. Uh, and I just mentioned before, the scriptures were written by mystics listening to God speaking his word within our hearts. <clears throat> Mysticism is about going beyond knowing about Jesus to knowing Jesus himself. And this is interesting. Everyone who seeks to truly love unconditionally is a mystic. If you want to, if you have this desire to love God above all things with all your heart, soul, and mind, as St. Francis de Sales said, you're, you're at the first step of becoming more involved in Christian mysticism. Children are born mystics. They don't have any preconceived notions or any, anything preventing them from loving unconditionally. They love their parents unconditionally. Uh, it's an example of seed thrown on good soil versus bad soil. The problem is, as children grow up, uh, dryness, the cares of the world, the pressures of life chokes off the growth and they get distracted and we get torn in other directions, as we all know. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a simple concept, but simplicity is sometimes the hardest thing to achieve because, I mean, I can, I can see myself right now thinking about these nine degrees, well, Geez, I'd never have time to do this, or I'd, I don't think I can spend enough time. Here again, I'm putting my conditions on this desire that I have. I have to have time to do this or it's not going to work. It's me, again, twisting this idea of 
of direct contact with God into my own situation. So I think we have to try to to approach this as a as a very simple thing. We want to love God unconditionally. He wants us to love Him unconditionally. The end point of that is union with Him. So start the process and leave the rest up to Him is kind of the idea, I think. Uh, the greatest mystics are those of us, and they are just like us, who manage to remain on good soil, avoid getting, who avoid getting caught up with the cares of the world and uh, the distractions of life. Uh, and I think I made this point before, Lionel, mysticism is not restricted to Christianity. There's a phrase from 1 John, everyone who loves is begotten of God and knows God. Everyone who loves is begotten of God and knows God. That doesn't, it doesn't say every Catholic who loves is begotten of God and knows God. It says every one. I mean, how can Christ not help? I think uh, Mother Teresa saw this so clearly. Uh, God loves every person on earth. He created us. So for us to think, well, uh, he doesn't love those Hindus as much as he loves us Catholics because, you know, we have the, the true church. That's not, I don't think that's, Mother Teresa saw so clearly, and that's why she had such a great outreach to people of all faiths, Muslim, Hindu, Catholic, Buddhist, whatever. She just welcomed them all and loved each one of them the way Christ loves us. So I think the, uh, yeah, I think you all know that. Uh, this is not restricted just to Christianity. Okay, who are mystics? People from all walks of life, like St. John of the Cross, lay people like St. Therese, uh, St. Catherine of Siena, nuns like St. Therese of Lisieux and St. Therese of Avila, deacons like St. Francis of Assisi, Yay. my man. And uh, Christian mysticism was founded by Christ himself. Uh, the first Christian mystic was possibly St. John the Evangelist. The Gospel of John presents a mystic's view of the life and the work of Jesus, and that it focuses primarily on the divinity of Jesus as manifested by his signs. The, 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 the Gospel of John is the book of signs, and he refers to them as signs. This sign Jesus manifested when he was, so he uses this word sign, uh, Somebody presented, uh, when we went through the, uh, when we studied the Gospel of John in uh, diaconal training, the priest who taught it likened the Gospel of John to an egg. And John is peeling a little piece off the egg. As you read through the Gospel, a little bit more becomes clearer, then a little bit more becomes clearer. And, and, and it's all the seven or eight instances of Jesus' signs. The woman at the well, the healing of the man born blind. We'll hear them all as we approach uh, Easter, because that gospel is, is used to really represent. And what John is doing is showing us that more about the divinity of Christ. The other evangelists are showing more about, you know, the Jewish tradition of Christ or, or, or his personal life in an intimate way like St. Luke does, or Mark who abbreviates everything. Actually, Mark started the whole process and everybody else kind of took off from him, except for John. John had this intimate relationship I mean, how can you not be a mystic when you're resting your head on Christ's chest at the Last Supper, saying, was it I, Lord? You know, I mean, that's, that's mysticism, but we don't have that privilege, unfortunately. But we can get there. We can get there, not physically, through the transforming union, where we become like Christ. Uh, St. Paul was a great Christian mystic. I mean, he had direct communication with God, he had to. You know, he his apostles' training was a little abbreviated. He didn't. It didn't take him three years to to learn about Christ by living with him. He learned it pretty quickly. Like I think in, in a few days in Damascus, you know, he was taught a lot about about Christ and uh, finally became, as you know, the great apostle to the Gentiles. But there was mysticism before Christ was born. As I mentioned, Jacob saw heaven open. Moses spoke directly with God on Mount Sinai. How could we not mention the Blessed Virgin Mary when you talk about a great mystic? She had direct experience with God. The angel spoke directly to her. The angel Gabriel, who stands at God's right hand, spoke directly with her, got her answer, 
and then you know she was living in the presence of Christ for the whole time, thirty years, before he began his public ministry. Uh, <clears throat> when Jesus declared <clears throat> that the Father and I are one in John ten, verse thirty. He proclaimed himself the union of God and humankind. And he offers this union to all that follow him. He gave the power to become sons of God to all who believe. John 1, verse 12. Uh, somebody asked me this question before. I think it was Lionel. What, how do you, what characterizes a mystic or a mystical life? Uh, one of the sources I read talks about enhanced vitality. Maybe you don't need to sleep as much as you used to. Enhanced productivity. Uh, wait till the writers of uh, management books find this one. <laughs> you know, if you really want to drive success in your business, you got to be a mystic. You know, I can hear it right now. Enhanced productivity. Serenity. Peace. A peaceful, you know, even though we may be troubled with financial issues, I don't have a job, whatever. Serenity. Joy. Willingness to suffer. One of the things you're going to read in here is that the further up the ladder you go, the greater your desire to suffer. Which explains why, why because Christ suffered. And if we can suffer and you, we become more closely united with him in his suffering. I mean, again, that's, I'm not there and I don't pretend to be there for a long time but because I, I haven't experienced that yet. So if that's a big deal, then let's, let's experience it and see what it's like. Uh, I think we're thinking about it in our current day terms. We haven't started up the ladder yet, but I think maybe once we get up the ladder, maybe things up there are a little different than they are down here. Uh, C.S. Lewis described discovering spirituality as discovering that you are in a boat. Mysticism is like pushing off from the dock. Since many leave safe mooring and perish in the waves, pushing off from the dock should not be done in a cavalier fashion, but pushing off into deep water can be exciting. There was a passage from scripture where Christ says, put your boats out into deep water and lower your nets. The issue is not whether the Christian should push off into deeper water, for Christians must do so if they intend to get anywhere, in C.S. Lewis, he says, what are boats for anyway? Uh, but rather, uh, the, the, the issue is where you are going. Not just that you're pushing off, but where are you going with this, with this journey? Another issue that arises in connection with mystics is the issue of public versus private revelation. Uh, everybody understands, I think, the difference between public and private revelation. Public revelation is ended with the death of the last apostle, sometimes referred to as the deposit of faith. Uh, but private revelation is refers to those who experience private messages from God or Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, even though there is no public revelation anymore, the church has progressed in its deeper understanding of the original deposit of faith. So we still have people studying and receiving insights as to what maybe what that apostle meant when he said something or uh, the Immaculate Conception for example was not mentioned in the first centuries of the church's life and was even denied in the Middle Ages but in 1854 as a result of the growing light of the Holy Spirit speaking to the hearts of the bishops of the church gathered around the Holy Father the dogma of the Immaculate Conception was announced. So that wasn't written anywhere. Uh, it took a lot of thinking and prayer and study for the church to finally realize that if Mary is going to be the mother of Jesus, she had to have been conceived immaculately, thus enjoying ahead of time the merits of Christ's death. Uh, private revelation means all other revelation. Uh, and of course, their Fatima messages are private revelation, as are the messages of Lourdes, Guadalupe, Garabandal, Medjugorje, Akita, Nak. There's many, many apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary where there is private revelation given to, to the recipients. 
Uh, the church does not enjoy the same providential protection for private revelation as it did for public revelation, which is why the church is so careful about declaring a particular apparition to be authentic. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, in most cases, it's the decision of the local bishop, as you know, as to whether that revelation should be accepted or not. Uh, how many of you were familiar, had ever been to St. Joseph's in Emmitsburg when Gianna Talone Sullivan was giving her Thursday night messages uh, at, the, at the Mass? Well, Cardinal Keeler stopped that in, in September of 2000. He didn't think it was authentic. He ordered the parish not to allow that anymore. It came to an end. Uh, the most the church can say about private revelation is that usually it does not contradict public revelation. That's the first thing they say. Nothing here that contradicts scripture or the teaching authority of the church. It seems to deserve human acceptance in contrast to something that must be based on faith like the divinity of Christ. That's not up for, for, for discussion. But private revelation certainly is, and that's, you know, the fact that there's a lot of human interaction involved is why the church is so very careful. But that has not stopped the church from giving special favor to certain private revelations, such as the messages of Fatima, uh, Lourdes, uh, the giving of the brown scapular to St. Saint, Saint Simon Stock. Those are all private revelation things that have been given great uh, latitude in the church. The Holy Rosary, for example, does not depend on the apparition of St. Dominic, but on basic theology. It consists of ten Our Fathers, the prayer that Christ himself taught us. Uh, the 50 Hail Marys, the first half of which is right out of Scripture. Hail Mary, full of grace. The second half was, was, was uh, composed by the, by the church. And also many popes have recommended the Holy Rosary. So that, the Rosary, again, is a private revelation practice. But we all practice it every single, you know, frequently, every day, hopefully. Uh, it is probably not spiritually healthy to center one's life on private revelation. Uh, they're good when they're approved, but the core of our faith lies in public revelation, the scriptures. The, you know, the, the, the letters, the letters of St. Paul, the letters of St. Peter.